the subcommittee is called to order again. Let me first of all remind the witnesses that uh, your full written statement will be entered into the record. If you can summarize your statements in a matter of five minutes, then that would be good. We have not had a problem so far. I think that we've been very uh, good as, as it relates to not going over the five minutes, and I really respect that and honor that. I want to call now to uh, testify before the subcommittee. Mr. Alfred C. Liggins III, he's the president and CEO of Radio One. Radio One is a minority-owned radio station, and, is the, and it is the seventh largest radio broadcaster and largely targets African Americans with urban-based programming. Welcome, Mr. Liggins, and please take five minutes to, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Russ and Ranking Member Stearns and members of the subcommittee for allowing me to testify here today. For those of you who have not, not met, uh, let me formally introduce myself. I am Alfred Liggins III, Exec Chief Executive Officer of Radio One Incorporated. Radio One Incorporated is currently the largest media company in the United States that primarily targets African Americans. Our media platform includes radio, print, satellite, internet, and our nationally distributed cable channel, TV One. Our Radio One network currently consists of 60 radio stations and can be found in 19 mostly large cities around the nation. Three of our stations serve the Detroit market with music and talk formats, including the first nationally syndicated Black Talk Network. Five of our stations in Dallas and Houston provide music formats, including our innovative contemporary inspirational format, which can now be heard on 12 FM radio stations across the country, including Charlotte and Augusta. However, those numbers do not really paint the full picture of who Radio One is. Radio One takes its responsibility to serve its communities very seriously. For this reason, the content broadcast on Radio One stations is a product and reflection of the audiences we serve. We at Radio One pride ourselves on our close-knit relations, uh, relationships with our listening audience and view them as members of our extended family. This causes us to be responsive to and engaged in the many public affairs issues facing the local communities where we broadcast. Just within the last week, two of our popular radio DJs who host shows with a hip-hop format, one of whom can be heard in Dallas and Augusta, and one of whom can be heard in Detroit, played an instrumental role in bringing national attention to the issues faced by the six black teenagers known as the Genesis Six. We are proud to say that the efforts of many of our local radio stations to raise awareness of the Genesis 6 case and organize bus caravans helped lead thousands of citizens, I think 50,000 citizens, to journey to Louisiana and played a pivotal role in making the Rally for Justice in Jenna such a resounding success. Also last week, in response to the senseless violence that is currently plaguing Philadelphia and causing the city to lead the nation in homicides, our local station there, Praise 103.9, organized a sold-out gospel concert featuring Yolanda Adams and Les Brown at Sharon Baptist Church, focusing on the theme, Black Life Has Value. We broadcast the concert live and also have personalities from our hip-hop station in attendance to show their support for this important message. I mention these events because they represent Radio One's commitment to our audience and are important to truly understanding who we are as a company. I applaud the subcommittee and Chairman Rush in particular for tackling this important topic. Throughout the course of our nation's history, there have been many debates and differing opinions regarding musical content, freedom of speech, and what constitutes art. Some have claimed the Bible is too violent, that Mark Twain is too racist, and I'm willing to bet 100 years from now we will still be debating these important issues. When it comes to hip-hop music, some may choose to focus on particular artists or music that they find objectionable. And I believe that that sort of debate is healthy and ultimately good for our society. However, it should be noted that hip-hop music is not representative of the bulk of the content that we at Radio One provide. Only a small minority, 14 out of 60 total radio stations, have an urban contemporary format, and they play hip-hop music, which often reflects the realities that many in these audiences face and observe in their daily lives. Radio One is also not in charge of creating content or in the business of censorship or determining what is in good or bad taste. However, while other media platforms do not have 
public interest obligations. As the members of this subcommittee know, are well aware, we are regulated by the Federal Communications Commission. Radio One has always taken great care to comply with FCC guidelines and standards in regards to content. In fact, it should be pointed out that of all the music platforms available to listeners today, only broadcast radio is required to take steps to protect our listeners. It is Radio One's policy that no song can be broadcast over the radio until it is listened to and the content reviewed. Also, every Radio One station has a program director who is directly responsible for the music that is broadcast on that station. Each of our radio stations receive radio edit versions of songs, which if necessary are further edited, consistent with FCC regulations and local community standards. Our program directors participate in a conference call every other week moderated by our Senior Vice President of Programming to discuss the content of music playing on our radio stations. Part of the success of Radio One is based on the fact that we as a company respond to the variety and diversity of musical tastes of our audiences. If Radio One did not play hip-hop music, we would not be serving our audience. Radio in many ways is a reflection of its community and what its listeners want to hear. We pride ourselves on being local broadcasters with the emphasis on local. It is broadcasters that offer the localism that communities need and deserve. While hip-hop music is many different things to many different people, it is important to remember this revolutionary art form has created a multitude of opportunities and economic benefits for those who may not otherwise have had such an opportunity. For example, Snoop Dogg's success has allowed him to create a football league intended to attract inner-city youth to football and not gangs. And David Banner has successfully used his star power to raise funds and increase visibility for the victims of Hurricane Katrina, which we participated in. We at Radio One are proud of our track record and are committed to serving the needs of our diverse audience and being responsible broadcasters. Again, I thank you for allowing me to testify before the subcommittee today, and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, very much. Our next and final uh, opening statement will come from uh, Mr. Strauss Zelnick, who is the chairman of the board of Take-Two Interactive Software Incorporated. Take-Two owns Rockstar Games, which makes the popular and controversial Grand Theft Auto video game series. And I might add other kinds of products also. Uh, Mr. Zelnick, welcome, and please take five minutes. For an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Stearns. <clears throat> I've already submitted my testimony into the record, so if I may, I'm going to speak uh, somewhat less formally to the committee. Uh, Chairman Rush, in the beginning, you talked about forming a coalition of concern, compassion, and commitment. And I think from everyone's comments today, I, I think it suggests that we see the world very much as you do. In fact, there's not a lot of uh, diversity of comments here. Um, I, I'm the chairman, as you said, of Take-Two Interactive, one of the world's largest uh, independent publishers of uh, interactive entertainment. Um, before that, I was the chief executive of a big record company, BMG. Before that, I was president of a big movie studio, 20th Century Fox. And I started my career in television at Columbia Pictures. As, as uh, Representative Stern said, our job is to make hits. That's what I've had to do my whole career. And uh, we make hits by paying attention to what our consumers want and uh, delivering them a product that most people like. So in my career, my company's not only put out products like Grand Theft Auto, but my company's released movies like Home Alone and been responsible for artists like Whitney Houston. Uh, this is a committee that's partially uh, focused on commerce. Um, this is a big business. While the music business has faced some declines of late, uh, and the movie business has basically been flat, interactive entertainment's been growing rapidly. Today, it's an $18.5 billion industry. It's bigger than the box office uh, in America and around the world and we employ about 250,000 people. And my own company, which some people here probably have never even heard of, does over a billion dollars a year in sales and we employ over 2,000 people around the world. I take this topic really seriously. Um, like many others here, I have children, I have three kids. Um, my oldest took the subway to school this morning in Brooklyn. Um, I'm really concerned about my kids' safety, their opportunities, violence that they see around them and that might affect them and a culture of civility, which seems pretty stressed right now. So I agree that this shouldn't be a discussion about finger-pointing. In fact, the evidence and common sense suggests that entertainment doesn't create values and certainly doesn't create behavior. 
as the interactive entertainment business has grown in the last 17 years, in fact, per capita violence in America, as stunning as it still is, is actually down 50% in those 17 years. Uh, what also is pretty remarkable is all the entertainment we produce is worldwide. It's a worldwide phenomenon. But many of the issues that we're discussing today are uniquely American problems. So why are we so special? Well, the first is, uh, sadly, there's ready access to guns in America. 35% of American households have firearms. Uh, despite our enormous wealth in this country, there's inadequate educational opportunity. There's domestic abuse. There's drugs. There's gang activity. And the list goes on. I'm also pleased that today's discussion isn't about the First Amendment. Everyone here agrees that the First Amendment must be protected. It seems to me that everyone here is proud that we live in a country that guarantees freedom of speech, even speech we don't like. So I think the discussion should be about what are we doing as an industry to address social concerns, and what are we doing when we bring our entertainment products out? Well, what are we doing in the interactive entertainment business? The first thing is the average age of our players is 33, and it's rising. The average age of our purchasers is 39. 92% of the industry's releases are for family and teens. Only 8% are for adults. The FTC, directed by this committee, reviewed our rating system and said it's the most rigorous in the business. 87% of parents are satisfied with our system, and all of our hardware has parental controls, which are easy, easy to use and encourage parents to make choices for their kids. And retailers comply with our system at least as effectively as cinema owners comply with motion picture ratings. So it seems to me the discussion should be about our responsibility, and I take that very seriously. We have three jobs to do at my companies. We've got to make great entertainment, because frankly, if we're not making hit entertainment that everyone wants to consume, we're not relevant, and I wouldn't be sitting here today. We also make art. Um, the reason I'm in this business is not just entertainment, certainly not just to make money. It's because I believe what I do is art, and that is our standard at all of our companies. If we don't believe it's art, we will not put it out. But art is in the eyes of the holder, and some art that some people consider beautiful, other people don't even consider pretty or even tasteful or acceptable. And finally, we're in the business of business, and uh, that's just the truth. We're in commerce, and that's why we're all sitting here, and that also is why we're relevant. I think there's an enormous line between entertainment and exploitation. We try to stay in the line of entertainment. Sometimes we make mistakes. It's our job to be vigilant about those and to correct them. And then when we make a product, we need to let parents and consumers know what it is before they get it home so they're not surprised and they don't consume something that they don't want to consume. Having done that, having tried to meet those standards, having reviewed our products, having played our games, when we put them in the box, I stand behind them fully and I take complete responsibility for what we put out. I welcome our dialogue today. Thank you for having me. I want to thank our, all of our witnesses. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes of questioning. I'm going to begin my question, um, and I'm, I'm going to address it to each and every one of you. Uh, a prominent hip hop executive and artist, Mr. Ruff, Russell Simmons, and others have suggested that the recording industry and artists ban or refrain from the use of hateful words or hateful speech. You know, the N word, the B word, the W word, uh, other words that are hateful uh, as it depicts racial and religious and sexual orientation. Do you believe that this is a viable, quote unquote, business model? Can your industries and your uh, corporations profit from such a ban or indeed such a plan, a pledge rather. I start with Mr. Dumont. 